Welcome along, fellow Beatle people. This article was published in the Liverpool Echo on Wednesday, October 23rd, 1963, on page 6. It was written by Tony Barrow, and it says, Disker of the Saturday Echo, and author of Meet the Beatles, to be published by World Distributors on Tuesday. And the headline is The Beatles, A Night They Nearly Disbanded. And the text of the article is as follows. In July 1961, at Litherland Town Hall, a Crosby man put on a show which could now pack Liverpool Stadium twice over end, probably leave thousands of disappointed ticket applicants. The name of this young and obviously astute ballroom club promoter was Brian Kelly. The name of his all-star attraction was The Beatmakers, a fabulous combination of The Beatles and Jerry's Pacemakers. George Harrison was featured on lead guitar. Paul McCartney played rhythm guitar. Les McGuire played saxophone. Les Chadwick was on bass guitar, John Lennon was at the piano, drummers Pete Best and Freddie Marsden laid down the king-size percussion beat, and Jerry provided the vocals. Sometime, just for old time's sake, I hope Liverpool will see and hear the beatmakers again. At some stage in the future, perhaps such a session could be restaged. Imagine the excitement generated by a massive Mercy Beat team like this. The one time only coming together of the Beatmakers formed a part of a Thursday series of public dances at Litherland. By the summer of 1961, the Beatles had returned from their second excursion to Hamburg, and they were now numbered among the top flight beat groups on Merseyside. This meant that they were earning something between 30 shillings and 70 shillings per man, for the majority of local club and ballroom managers rebelled at the idea of paying more than about 20 pounds for the two groups requiring to fill in an evening's bill. In these circumstances, it isn't surprising that the Beatles were not prepared to aim their ideas at long-term existence in the Mercy Beat battle. Quote, I think they felt as though they couldn't get off the treadmill. End quote. Here's the way compare Bob Wooler puts it. The rates they were content to ask were ridiculously low, certainly nothing approaching a living wage, with the group's equipment to be looked after and replaced on top of all the other routine expenses, end quote. By September of 1961, it looked as though the Beatles might consider disbanding. Paul and John had hitchhiked to Paris for a holiday. George and Pete Best seemed to have gone into hiding so far as the music scene was concerned. They looked in at lunchtime cavern sessions now and again, but they seldom took any active part in any performances there. The following month, Brian Epstein paid a visit to the cavern. Paul and John had returned from France with sufficient enthusiasm to persuade their colleagues to accept new bookings. The first of these were witnessed by Brian Epstein. Brian Epstein had been aroused by customers of his city record stores. More and more teenagers had been demanding discs by the Beatles. But the only release Brian could trace was one made and put out in Germany. In view of the group's offbeat attire and uniformly bush-like thatches of hair, Brian could be forgiven for imagining that the four men he watched in the cavern were German musicians from some Hamburg scene. Cavern club owner Ray McFall remembers Brian's earliest visit to his cellar of beat. Quote, The last thing I wanted was for the Beatles to break up. We all realized there was a possibility of this happening, and Bob Wooler had tried to get in touch with Jack Good in London to tell him about the group. Good's Oh Boy television series had finished, and he'd left for America before Bob could make any sort of contact. End quote. Brian Epstein's decision to encourage the Beatles was the greatest turning point in their lives. He put them through a process which was little short of brainwashing, but he did it all in the most discreet way. The boys welcomed his urgent encouragement. By his own example, he gave them a sense of responsibility. By all the more polite means at his disposal, Brian changed the Beatles from an artistically promising but most unbusinesslike quartet of youngsters into the fantastic entertainers they are today. And then there's a headline that says, Those Jackets. And the text is as follows. In the last few months of 1961, Brian Epstein grew more and more convinced that the Beatles were destined for great things, providing ways could be sought whereby their latent talent could be drawn into full view. From the beginning, Brian appreciated their musical skill, understood their shortcomings, and respected their freedom to develop individual vocal, instrumental personalities 
along their own chosen lines. Brian began to minimize the group's late arrivals for appearances by picking up each of the boys from his respective home by car. He persuaded them of the huge advantages involved in acquiring smart, stylistic stage dress sense. When Paul and John suggested that the group should modify and adopt his regular stage attire, the type of collarless jackets that they had seen in Paris, Brian had suitable patterns designed. These new suits were to become a nationally renowned byproduct of the Beatles' later fame. The clothing industry of Britain must be thoroughly grateful to the boys for the trade put in their way. This year's teenage craze for the style of jackets worn by the Beatles must have brought an unexpected amount of extra business to the nation's outfitters. Shortly before the announcement of the 1961 Mercy Beat popularity poll results, Brian Epstein became the Beatles' manager. The poll showed that the group had become number one favorites throughout the Northwest. Had Brian Epstein been a professional manager of many groups, he could not, in fairness to his other artists, have concentrated so much of his time and energy on the Beatles. On the other hand, Brian was a newcomer to the management game. He combined a shrewd business mind with a keen enthusiasm for all things theatrical. To bring the Beatles to the attention of the record companies, he was prepared to step far beyond the normal duties and limitations of the average beat group manager. Once the Beatles had gained a recording contract, he went on to make the same intense effort on behalf of other people like Billy J. Kramer, the Dakotas, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Foremost, Cela Black, and Tommy Quickly. But all these artists came into the picture at a much later stage. His initial target was to gain national and international recognition for the Beatles. And the next headline is the word indifferent. And the text is as follows. The whole task of launching the Beatles upon an unsuspecting Tin Pan Alley was much more complex than Brian imagined it would be. He says, quote, Once the group had won first place in the poll, I imagined that this substantial local success might be used as a powerful handle in London. On my first trip to the capital, I met with a response which was dismally indifferent. At length, however, Decca agreed to send someone up to Liverpool to hear the Beatles at the Cavern. Their executive, Mike Smith, expressed initial desire to put the boys on record. He set up an audition date for the Beatles to visit Decca's studio on New Year's Day 1962. Decca's show of delight was pronounced enough for me to comment in, off the record, upon the likelihood of a recording contract reaching Brian's Liverpool offices at any moment. To everyone's surprise, a second, and presumably more influential, executive decided that the Beatles would not be a worthwhile proposition for Decca Records. And then the next headline is Ringo Arrives, and the text is as follows. Eventually, recalls Brian, my tapes found tangible favor with George Martin, the EMI producer, who offered a proper studio audition which led to the release of Love Me Do the following October. To follow through Brian Epstein's story, I have left out of its chronological sequence the arrival of the Beatles' present drummer Ringo Starr. Between the end of 1959 and the middle of 1962, Ringo drummed with a succession of different Liverpool outfits. His first lengthy spell was with the Eddie Clayton Skiffle Group, but there are photographs to show that a bearded Ringo supplied the driving beat behind at least a dozen other combos, including the Dark Town Skiffle and the changing groups led by Rory Storm. Oddly enough, since he is the most recent addition, Ringo has become such a typical Beatle that one finds it difficult to imagine the group performing without him. Such a close unison of thought, of musical expression, and of intimate friendship has now established itself around John, Paul, George, and Ringo that one feels the group would disband entirely if even one member was obliged to quit this unique foursome at some future date. The nature of the thickly knit relationship between these four young men goes far beyond that of most groups of professional artistes. The remainder of the Beatles' history will be more familiar to Echo readers. This series of record-breaking achievements began in the early part of 1963, when Please Please Me, the group's second record release, went to the very top of the hit parade. It won them their first Silver Disc Award for sales in excess of a quarter of a million, and it gave its name to their first LP album, which has been at the number one spot on the LP charts continuously since the month of its issue. All the opportunities afforded to makers of hit discs came in the way of the Beatles. And the next headline is Beat Boom. 
and the text as follows. There were radio and television appearances, strings of pop package concert dates all over the country, extraordinary advance orders for every new record scheduled for release, and, as a direct consequence of the Beatles' popularity, an emergence of numerous other Liverpool groups as minor or major recording stars. According to compare Bob Wheeler, there would not be half the number of first-class beat groups on Merseyside if the Beatles had made records and achieved national recognition 12 months earlier. He says, quote, Throughout 1962, the Beatles were making very frequent appearances at the Cavern and at other Merseyside venues. They were already top dogs in the whole of the Northwest area. So it was natural that members of the less successful group should try to locate the secrets of their popularity. In among the crowds of front row female fans at the Cavern, there would be little knots of semi-professional musicians watching every gesture, every mannerism, every movement made by the Beatles. Each individual action was observed and noted, down to the fingering of each guitar and the flexing of each vocal note. I don't say that all other city groups decided to become carbon copies of the Beatles, but without a doubt, the majority of them took tips from the success of the area's leading beat stars, and as soon as the Beatles got their recording contract, a sort of gold rush began. London producers were sent up to Liverpool by every leading record company. Talent scouts visited each of the Merseyside's better-known clubs and ballrooms. The place was besieged by folk who took Please Please Me as the starting pistol for the big beat race. Quite suddenly, Liverpool turned itself quite involuntarily into the pop music capital of the country. And that, my fellow Beatle people, concludes the article that was published in the Liverpool Echo on Wednesday, October 23rd, 1963. Kindly let me know your thoughts about this article in the comments below. Until next time, I wish you safe travels on all your journeys.